Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Axel, thank you very much for the generous introduction. I'm not going to follow form and share the glass of water. I'm going to have one all of my own. Um, it's a real pleasure and a delight to be back in Amsterdam. I've had to wait some 17 years to give a speech here in English, so I'm going to enjoy myself. Um, it's a real treat to be here and to see how the three great museums on the, on the square here have, have emerged triumphant after their recent restorations. They do things slowly but properly here in the Netherlands, so it's, it's, it's taken a little while. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that uh, collectively the, the Rijksmuseum, the Van Gogh Museum, the revitalized Stedelijk Museum, so in our form, I think what you can describe as one of the greatest museum quarters anywhere in the world. Uh, and I'm sure you'll also agree with me that, um, <clears throat> that Axel Ruger and the staff of the Van Gogh Museum really deserve the fullest praise, not just for the current project, but for the representation of the museum itself. That original building by uh, Gerrit Rietveld, I think it just looks better than ever. So. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was asked to uh, offer some introductory remarks at the, at the start of this symposium. And as I'm sure you'll have seen from what, uh, the, the paperwork, Mariah Felicope and uh, the colleagues here, they have put together a, a really impressive program. And there will be time to, to delve forensically on many aspects of this project and the, the fascinating uh, ground that it, that it covers. I thought this afternoon, um, I thought it might be appropriate to, to maybe step back a bit and uh, to, to continue that, that celebratory note that we've just heard and keep things festive. Obviously, I want to uh, acknowledge all the work that's gone into the uh, the Van Gogh, Van Gogh Studio Practice Project, and I know many of you have been involved in that, and we, we want to acknowledge all that. Um, but we're also, we are also marking the 160th anniversary of the birth of Van Gogh, and the 40th anniversary of the founding of the Van Gogh Museum, two very important milestones. And it seems to me that the, the Van Gogh Museum has has been on something of a fascinating journey over the past 40 years. Through its recent work and across several long-term projects, it has taken the study of the artist to a new level. And I thought we might reflect on that a little this afternoon. The study of Van Gogh itself has also moved on in considerable ways in, in recent decades. And what I'm going to do is I, I, would, I really want to propose that we not only have a deeper understanding of Van Gogh, but our view, our view of how he thought, how he approached his art, his interchange with other artists, that's shifted, it's developed in some significant ways. There's a standard image that I certainly inherited of Van Gogh as something of an untamed, passionate, intuitive artist. And I think that's gradually and subtly shifting to allow a, a greater appreciation of the, the calculation, the logic, the rationale that underpins at least some of his work. Well, if that seems like an ambitious program for a late afternoon speech, don't panic. No need to look nervously at your watches. I'm very aware that I'm all that stands between you and the first cocktail of the day, and indeed, a visit to the exhibition. So I promise you, we will keep things moving at a good, brisk pace. Well, ladies and gentlemen, back in the 1950s and 1960s, there were various ideas circulating about how best to establish a permanent home for the Van Gogh family collection of paintings, drawings, and archive material. One of the proposals, I'd forgotten this, but one of the proposals was actually to build a special wing here at the Stedelijk Museum. 
if uh, fate had taken a different turn, we might now all be sitting in the, the Van Gogh annex with Vincent's work serving as some kind of permanent prologue to a narrative about modern and contemporary art. Well, that was a lucky escape. The decision, the decision to build a separate independent museum poised between the Rijksmuseum and the Stedelijk, that was really a rather bold one at a time when successful single artist museums were relatively rare. There on the screen is Gerrit Rietveld's original model for the Van Gogh Museum. And yes, you're right, it does look more elegant in the model, but that's often the way of these things. When the museum first opened back in June 1973, there were none of those fashionable mission statements and corporate objectives that we consider so compulsory today. But you can get a sense of the founding vision. You can get a sense of it from the the various speeches and the, the statements that were made at the time, especially those of the engineer Van Gogh, the nephew of the artist, and the man who was the driving force behind the creation of the new institution. Now, the engineer Van Gogh had grown up surrounded by his uncle's paintings, both literally, physically, and psychologically. There he is on the left-hand side in Laren in the family home in 1949. And over the years, he had become, well, I think it would be safe to say he had become suspicious of responses to Van Gogh's work which were overly gushing or emotional. And he was kind of accustomed to the rather mawkish views of his mother, Joanna, who'd helped to fashion what you might describe as a, a sentimental attitude to Vincent's art. As he once recalled, I quote, at home it was rapture, rapture all the time with no attempt to justify oneself. And so when later in his life, when it came to the idea of founding a museum to house the family collections, the engineer wanted something, something more objective, something a little bit more detached. And he spoke of a museum that could educate, improve, inspire, and he described his, his desire to unlock the innate creativity of the visitors. And I suppose he was really very aware of the risk of creating something which, which would just become a kind of sentimental mausoleum. Uh, and he felt that everything must be done to keep the place, I quote, lively and alive. It was his wish, for example, his specific wish, that uh, the new Van Gogh Museum should contain a workshop for self-expression. And there behind me, you see my, my favorite image of the creative workshop. Uh, I don't know if you can make out quite what's going on there, but perhaps only in Amsterdam would you pose a nude model on a bicycle. <laughs> the creation, of, the creation of, a, of a serious museum for Van Gogh, one which was serious but also had a, a broad popular appeal, that's a very compelling vision. But in practice, certainly in the early years, difficult to realize. And certainly I think it's quite clear that in the early years, the new museum struggled to meet what were apparently conflicting needs of uh, various audiences. It was difficult for it to combine its various roles as a, as a place of pilgrimage for tourists, as a, as a museum rooted in the local community, as a place and a center for serious art historical research. As we've heard, there were more than 200 paintings, 500 drawings, a whole wealth of uh, archival material, including the bulk of the artist's surviving letters. So there was plenty of scope to engage visitors in a deeper understanding of the painting, of the painter, his motives and his methods. But the public, who came in large numbers from the outset, they were really drawn to the museum I suppose almost as a shrine, a place where they could experience and confirm their image of the artist as a tragic, romantic hero. And we all know that in the second half of the 20th century, the Van Gogh of the popular imagination was really already something of a grotesque caricature. 
generations of art lovers had, had grown used to a lazy cliche of Van Gogh, uh, a crazed and suffering genius, a spontaneous, unworldly victim whose art was the byproduct of insanity, suffering, and despair, a man buffeted by a dysfunctional mind and by external factors. A wonderful caricature, perhaps, and certainly one that had been fashioned by literature, by film, and by television. Who could forget Kirk Douglas's brilliant performance as Van Gogh in Vincenti Minnelli's 1956 classic, Lust for Life, as we see there on the screen? That image of the alienated, lonely artist, feverish and suicidal, mingling fact with fiction, legend with melodrama, what a compelling image that was. I was always quite convinced that there were generations of visitors to the Van Gogh Museum who came and were disappointed that Van Gogh did not look more like Kirk Douglas. <laughs> it was not until the mid-1980s and early 1990s and under the leadership of director Ronald DeLeo that the museum began to establish a secure course uh, it began to seem possible to present Van Gogh in, in an appealing and an engaging way, yet at the same time explore the complexity of his art, bring out the range of his thought and the, the intricacy of his relationships with his contemporaries. And so, for example, a program of exhibition a program of exhibitions of rather wider ambition helped to establish an international reputation for the museum. There on the screen is the, the poster of the great 1990 retrospective held in Amsterdam and at the Kruller-Müller Museum in Otterloo. Uh, still almost a, a quarter of a century on something that uh, is etched in the memory of those of us who were lucky enough to experience it. And then an important decision was taken to embark on long-term research projects to exploit the depth of the Van Gogh holdings. And these eventually became what you might describe as three mega projects. The fully annotated edition of the artist's letters, a series of scholarly catalogues of the museum's holdings of drawings and paintings, and most recently, the wide-ranging research for Van Gogh at work that we celebrate today. Well, as with so many endeavors in life, all of these became longer and more complex than anyone imagined at their outset. However, I think that all of us with an interest in Van Gogh and all of us with an interest in the, the wider 19th century, we're now reaping the rewards of this far-sighted approach. Work on the, the new edition of Van Gogh's Letters began back in 1994, and it was eventually published in 2009, some 15 years later. But even though it has been available now for, for three years, I, for one, am, am really still coming to terms with the depth of the scholarship that's been involved. It was referred to earlier, and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the edition, which is brilliantly edited by Leo Janssen, Hans Lauten, and uh, Ninka Backer, produced in a traditional book form, which we see on the, the screen, but also available, as Hans Klever reminded us, uh, freely available to all users on the website. And what's happened in this edition is that the editors have, in effect, rescued Van Gogh's letters from the accumulated inaccuracies and misinterpretations of various previous editions. And you could say that with painstaking research, they stripped out errors in transcription, they removed embellishments in translation, and embellishments which had really gradually come to distort and impair our view of the writings. Most important, perhaps of all, the extent of extensive annotations provide invaluable background information on people, places, works of art, all of which had fired Van Gogh's imagination. 600 or so people that he mentions identified 
2,000 artworks that he refers to traced and identified. Hundreds of quotes, sometimes indirectly used in his letters, have been tracked down. Now, you might think that all of that adds somehow to the, the complexity of Van Gogh's studies. But to me, it seems that this is, in many ways, an exercise in purification. And it seems easier to capture the underlying patterns of the artist's ideas. For many years, the letters were plundered for evidence to support an oversimplified narrative of a tragic life. And now, in this edition, we can perhaps appreciate the clarity, the consistency that lies behind Van Gogh's thinking. Well, yes, there's plenty of exuberance, there's plenty of uh, melancholy, there's no shortage of despair, but ultimately, as you read through those texts, it is the exceptional lucidity of his approach that comes through. And in many respects, what emerges is a very rational man trying to make sense of his life, his mission, and the role that his art could play in society. Alongside the letters edition, then, there was the other oil tanker of a project which was begun in the 1990s when the museum decided to produce this scholarly catalogues of its own holdings of drawings and paintings by Van Gogh. And at first, at first these uh, followed a fairly traditional approach to museum cataloguing. Studio practice, technique were important elements in the studies, but as work progressed, it did become clear that a much greater understanding of the materials and techniques used by the artist was required. So, for example, by the time it came to the fourth catalogue on the drawings, which was published in, I think, 2007, that featured a very close collaboration with the Netherlands Cultural Heritage Agency, uh, particularly on the various inks used by Van Gogh in his later work. And that study of the inks, that study of the papers, their degradation, that's now become one of the key focuses of technical studies on the drawings. Here on the screen, I show you a rather extreme example of one of the drawings made by Vincent at the ruined Abbey uh, of Montmayeur uh, near Arles in 1888, uh, an example of the fading of the purple and line ink that he favored for this group of works. And of course, only at the very margin there, uh, an area once protected by a mount, can we glimpse just a glimpse of the original intensity of the purple color. And for the rest, we're left simply with a ghost of an image, left trying to imagine the original fierceness and intensity of the work. Then there were the volumes on Van Gogh's paintings, of which two have been published so far. Uh, for the first of these, on Van Gogh's Dutch years, which um, uh, Rob mentioned earlier. Technical examination was present, but formed really only a, a limited part. But, but that approach was radically different for the second paintings volume on Antwerp and Paris paintings published in 2011. Surely one of the most impressive catalogues of its kind to be published in recent years. A work in which Art history, conservation, and science are really very closely knitted together in texts with extensive and ambitious technical analysis. So there was a change of tack, uh, but there were various reasons behind that. Um, in part, it was stimulated by the work on the, the Van Gogh Gauguin exhibition of 2001-2002 with the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, an exhibition for which conservators had carried out a, a wide range of examinations of works by, by both artists, yielding new insights into collaboration and, and working methods. But there was something else going on, something a little bit more nervy going on in the background. Um, and certainly the, the greater emphasis on technical analysis was encouraged by ongoing debates surrounding the authenticity of works by Van Gogh. As I'm sure you know, since its opening, the Van Gogh Museum had 
offered opinions on authenticity to external owners in the belief that this gave the researchers sight of a range of works by Van Gogh or would-be Van Goghs that otherwise they simply wouldn't see. But with increasing publicity and attention, excuse me, increasing uh, publicity and attention uh, surrounding the, these issues in the, the 1990s and into the 21st century, I think it would be fair to say that the museum was, was struggling to establish an objective voice. And it was, I think, becoming increasingly obvious that curators and researchers needed access to more reliable technical data, as well as a more scientific approach to lend more weight, to lend more authority to its opinions. Here on the screen, the famous version of the sunflowers purchased in 1987 by a Japanese insurance company for its in-house museum. And a good example, of, in a way, of how controversy surrounding authenticity could, could rumble on, as it did in this case, for many years. It should really have been a, an easy job to prove what is patently obvious, that it is a, a work by Van Gogh. But the lack of complete technical data, the lack of reliable comparative material, that really frustrated the museum's efforts to compile what you might describe as a, a convincing slam dunk opinion. Well, as these longer term research projects on the letters and the paintings and the drawings developed and expanded, something else was becoming increasingly apparent. That was the imbalance between that vast amount of data available on Van Gogh and the relative scarcity of comparable information on his contemp contemporaries. There was really an obvious need for more contextual information to clarify what did Van Gogh absorb from those around him and how much did he himself invent or make up as he went along. And so, as Moriah has told us, the third complementary project on the artist's studio practice was born and which we mark with this symposium. But well, as you've heard, like all large projects, this one has had its twists and turns, its discoveries, its distractions, its disappointments. Uh, that's inevitable in a venture that spans many years, many areas, and involves so many partners. And it's not going to be my role now to attempt a critical appraisal of what has gone well and what has gone less well. I leave that up to you, unlike many of you in the audience, I can't claim to be an expert in technical art history or its recent applications in the 19th century. But aside from the obvious concrete achievements of the major publications and the exhibition, there are several aspects of this project which impress me as an outside observer, someone who is very firmly outside the triangle. Perhaps most impressive of, uh, of all is the degree of collaboration and partnership working that has been involved in it. You've heard a bit about that uh, uh, already. And when I was thinking about this, I think it is really rather striking how much this type of collaboration has, has changed and developed in recent years. My own first experience of, a, of an interdisciplinary approach to technical art history, that was at the National Gallery back in 1990, working as part of a team on a project called Art in the Making Impressionism with David Bomford here in the audience in the second row, Oshok Roy already mentioned earlier, and Joe Kirby. This was one of a series of exhibitions which involved art historians, conservators, scientists, working closely together, coordinating our findings into integrated texts. Back then, when there was really a huge emphasis in, in 19th century art history and on subject matter and on historical context, there was something of a gap in museum studies of the, the materials and techniques of, for example, Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. What fun we had, eh, David? Here's one of the um, pictures that we included in the uh, exhibition. Uh, some of the pictures that 
we examined were extremely complex and, and multi-layered. Others, like this study by Monet, painted on the beach at Trouville in one blow in 1870, were delightfully simple. simple. And close examination showed that the, the surface of the painting was peppered with fragments of shell blown up onto the surface of the canvas as he worked out of doors. You see details of that on the left-hand side. It was really a, a gift for helping to capture the imagination of the public. Indeed, David, if my memory serves me right, those shell fragments had been touched out at some stage and you removed the retouchings prior to the exhibition so that the, the full shell-blown uh, picture could be seen in all its um, glory. Fragments of shell getting everywhere. We missed a sponsorship opportunity there. <laughs> Back then, back uh, almost a quarter of a century ago, that the idea of collaboration between bookish art historians, that's me, and microscope-wielding conservators, scientists, I suppose that still seemed relatively novel. Today, it is the norm, and it's part of the mainstream of art history and museum curatorship. Um, there have obviously been a great many changes in the time since then, since 1990. Changes, I suppose you would talk about uh, advances in analytical techniques or in uh, access to ever more sophisticated uh, equipment. The digital revolution, which has transformed the, the study, the availability, the dissemination of data and information. But thinking of all this, I thought it was really rather in the breadth rather than in the depth that I see the, the real differences and the most positive developments of recent years. Partnership, um, which we heard about, it, it now means something different. It means something more extensive. As Axel says, it, it involves working across different types of organizations, private and public, across different collections, across different countries. Interdisciplinary, that means something else as well. It seems to involve a broader range of historical contexts alongside pure art history. Uh, it involves a broader range of conservation disciplines of different kinds of science, whether it's engineering or biology or whatever. And I think if before we might have spoken of centers of excellence. We might have talked about London or Washington or Munich or Amsterdam or wherever. Now I think we have to speak about networks of excellence, net networks that stretch around the world. And this is something which has been, I think, particularly healthy for Van Gogh studies. Um, in the past, the world of Van Gogh scholarship somehow seemed a little bit closed, uh, rather dominated by a handful of somewhat aloof, authoritative uh, figures, the eminence grise of the, the Van Gogh world. Now it seems much more open, much more fluid, experts from across the world sharing information and ideas as we see in the program for this uh, symposium. I think that's fantastic, I think it's brilliant, I think it's something to welcome and applaud. Well, excuse me. It's one thing I suppose to be impressed by the process, but what about the outcomes? How has Van Gogh at work and the project changed and altered our view of Van Gogh, his practice, and his relationship to his contemporaries? Well, very big questions, and perhaps ones to pose again after two days of talks and discussions. But what begins to emerge, for me, is an artist who seems rather more systematic, rather more controlled in his choices than I had imagined previously. Now, I have to be careful here, uh, because I think with Van Gogh, it is always rather difficult to get the right balance between intuition, passion, spontaneity on the one hand, and method, structure, and logic on the other. And in some ways, all of these qualities, all of them can be present and competing in his life and his art at any one time. 
But if you study the trends, study the patterns, study the research, if you plot the choices and the decisions of the painter, it is that underlying deliberation, the self-awareness, and even control that start to become more striking. For me, this comes through across this entire project and the various studies of techniques, developments, materials, and influences. And I've selected just a few examples from the, uh, the Van Gogh at Work project to, to illustrate this. Take, for example, our view of the early years of the artist's development from clumsy beginner to accomplished draftsman and painter. Now everyone knows that Van Gogh was largely untrained and mostly self-taught, and we tend to see his path to progress as a rather haphazard journey. But the work for this project has given us a much more complete view of his, what you might describe as his self-constructed curriculum, and the the mix of formal and informal elements in his artistic education. And gradually as you follow it, gradually you get a better idea of what he gleaned from published sources, such as artists' manuals, what he was able to take away from his, his brief periods of academic instruction and supervision, and what he himself learned from sheer experiment and repetition. And there's more structure, there's more direction in there than you might imagine. You see a hint of this in Van Gogh's use of the portfolios of, of lithographs by Charles Barg. Uh, together, three of these portfolios, published by the dealers Goupil, were intended to constitute a complete course in drawing. Now, it's long been known that Van Gogh copied these sheets, and on the screen there, one of a, one of a, a handful, a very small handful of these copies that survives. That's Van Gogh uh, copying Holbein after a sheet in, uh, uh, by Charles Barg. Um, but Tayo Maidendorp's recent research for this, and we'll hear more about this in, a, uh, in the coming days, Tayo's recent research really reveals the full extent of Van Gogh's use of these portfolios, working his way through one of the albums no fewer than four times making hundreds, hundreds of copies as he attempted to acquire the basic skills of his craft. Now, there's certainly dogged determination at work there, but there is also a sense of someone with a clear sense of direction, even if the course he follows is sometimes unusual and idiosyncratic. Similar remarks apply, and this is the last time you'll see this image today, Similar remarks apply when we follow the detailed analyses of the materials used by Van Gogh across his career. You'll see in a moment, but in the exhibition, it is completely fascinating to follow the deconstruction of Van Gogh's workshop practices. As looking at it and thinking about it, it's, it's almost as if you're looking at some kind of a gigantic exploded view diagram uh, from the details of supports to the colored grounds, to the analysis of drawing materials, to the pigments. You see the individual components of his approach laid out before us. Now, it was always my assumption that Van Gogh's choices of materials, whether it's drawing or painting, were, were driven mainly by expediency, by what was available, what, was, uh, what he was able to afford. But as you look at the, the latest research for this project, you see a more subtle, a more complex pattern of preferences. You get a clear idea of how he matched choices to his expressive aims. And as the researchers track his particular materials, the use of particular materials and pigments right across his career, and those choices are more meticulous, more deliberate than certainly I imagined, extending even to the selection of particular inks or particular qualities of paint from an individual supplier. The famous self-portrait on the screen made at the end of the Paris period, we now know, was made using an, an inferior cobalt blue, less, uh, less brilliant than the pigment that he preferred. And what better way 
What better way to illustrate the importance of color to the artist than to show just how aware he was of the qualities of the paint available from different sources? And then finally, there is, I think, a greater sense of method and program coming through in the studies of the artist's relationship to his friends and contemporaries. As we've heard, one of the key aims of the Van Gogh at Work project was to clarify the nature of that relationship between Van Gogh and his contemporaries. As I'm sure you know, dialogue and exchange and idea of community were really central to Van Gogh's philosophy. And when, even when he worked in relative isolation, his art was, was nurtured by contact of some kind with peers and with friends. Well, this was always going to be perhaps the most challenging aspect of the research project, given the disparity between the depth of all we know about Van Gogh and the much more fragmentary knowledge and information that is accessible to the artists, on the artists in his circle. Nevertheless, as we'll hear in the coming days, there are really important new insights from the technical studies for some of the closest artistic relationships. For example, between Van Gogh and Gauguin, between Van Gogh and Emile Bernard. And there's light, new light too, on some of the more elusive exchanges. For example, with Toulouse-Lautrec. And here on the screen, just to, uh, to hint at that, one of the paintings that Van Gogh made in Paris, uh, the view from Theo's apartment in 1887, in which he experiments with thinned paint and using a very graphic pointily style. When you think about it, and when you consider Van Gogh experimenting together with Toulouse-Lautrec, adapting techniques taken over from Degas, working in a style influenced by Sora and Signac, then you get a sense of his dynamic yet lucid approach. And what emerges is a, an artist who is always willing to experiment, always willing to learn, to adapt new ways of working. But if he found that these didn't suit, or that they couldn't be adapted to his artistic temperament or match his expressive aims, then he would unceremoniously dump them and move on. And you find that clarity of purpose wins through every time. Over the coming days, we will hear many more details about Van Gogh's practice and about his relationship to his contemporaries. But when we do step back, and when we do look at that bigger picture, then, in my view at least, our image of Van Gogh has shifted. It has changed. In the narratives of later 19th century art, we're used to the idea of Vincent as some kind of unruly, impetuous outsider. We might speak of the consistency of Monet, of the uh, method of Cezanne, the scientific discipline of Sura, but with Van Gogh, it's, we use terms such as intuition, instinct, or whatever, to describe his rapid development from novice to master. Well, when we look across these three major projects that I've mentioned, the Letters Edition, the Van Gogh Museum Collection Catalogues, and now this studio practice project, the cumulative results the results, when they're all brought together, suggest we should temper this with a greater appreciation of the care, deliberation, and logic that underpinned Van Gogh's approach. He remains a complex, ambiguous figure, embracing the extremes of madness and method. But ladies and gentlemen, it seems time now to give more credit to the latter. Ladies and gentlemen, at the start of these remarks, uh, I said that I'd been asked to, to strike a, a festive tone as we embark on the two days of this symposium. And I'm happy to do that because there is a lot to celebrate. And I would certainly want to congratulate the various teams that have contributed to Van Gogh at work uh, across so many disciplines and over many years, 12 years. That's longer than the average marriage. Uh, so we certainly also look forward to hearing more in the coming days. I also want to congratulate Axel Ruger and the staff of the Van Gogh Museum on their 40th anniversary. 
For a young institution, the museum has seen many changes across its short history, but I think it's fair to say that it has now established a truly authoritative position in scholarship and research in 19th century art. And equally important, equally important, it has found ways to bring us closer to Van Gogh's art without dispelling the magic of creativity and the compelling expressive power of an artist who remains a singular and highly distinctive talent. There are, ladies and gentlemen, there are perhaps many aspects of the present Van Gogh Museum that the original founders might find strange. Uh, they might be amazed to see the numbers of people who flock to the museum square from all over the world. They might be slightly taken aback by the full force of 21st century consumer power in action. But surely, surely they would applaud the combination of serious scientific research translated in innovative ways to appeal to the popular imagination. And if, if it was the engineer Van Gogh's wish to create a museum that is lively and alive, serious and popular, then that wish has surely been realized. Thank you very much. <laughs>